Hello and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I am Beth Erickson. Our topic today is abandoned mine drainage in the Susquehanna River Basin. And with us is Andrew King, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission's Mine Drainage Coordinator. Andrew has been instrumental in the success of treating acid-laden Susquehanna River Basin waters from Clearfield to Columbia counties. He's been involved with numerous ongoing mine drainage activities throughout the basin, including data management, inspection, and maintenance of passive treatment systems, as well as applications for funding to remedy legacy mining impacts. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you for presenting today's program. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm happy to be here. Great. So tell us more about yourself and the work that the Susquehanna River Basin Commission does. Sure. Uh, the commission was originally formed to protect and regulate the Susquehanna water supply to ensure that there's always enough water for aquatic life, commercial use, private use, and recreation. Um, since then, the role of the commission has expanded and deals with many aspects of the health of the river, including abandoned mine drainage, um, which is what I'm here to talk about today. As you mentioned, I'm the mine drainage program coordinator for the commission. Uh, my program works to investigate and remediate acid mine drainage. Um, uh, you'll hear me refer to that as AMD a lot today. That's what we're here for. Well, let's get started with today's presentation to find out more. So, Andrew, when you are ready, please begin. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining in. We already got the introductions out of the way, so let's get started. Um, abandoned mine drainage is, is a serious problem in Pennsylvania, but unless you live near it, you may have never heard of it. So today's presentation is an introduction to abandoned mine drainage. I'll start with a little background information. Coal was first mined in Pennsylvania in the 1700s near Pittsburgh, and it drove the industrial revolution of our country. Smokeless coal from Pennsylvania was accredited as the factor that won many historic naval battles. Coal helped to build our country into what it is today. At its peak, Pennsylvania was producing over 275 million tons of coal a year, and it's estimated that over 15 billion tons of coal have been mined in, from the state. There are four coal producing regions in Pennsylvania. The largest is the main bituminous field in the western part of the state. As the name implies, this is where bituminous or soft coal is mined. There's the broad top field in the south central portion of the state, the northern bituminous field in Tioga County, and then the east is the anthracite field where anthracite or hard coal is mined. Um, anthracite is the smokeless coal that I mentioned earlier. While coal has done great good for our country, it's also left behind severe scars. Prior to 1977, when a company was done mining, they could just walk away without doing any type of land reclamation. These abandoned mines fill with water, and through a chemical process, which we'll talk about later, that water becomes mine drainage that's loaded with metals and is often highly acidic. That water then exits the mine, flows into streams and rivers, and has a harsh impact on the water, on the water quality and aquatic life. The Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's latest report states that there are over 7,356 miles of streams in Pennsylvania that are impaired by AMD. Over 7,000 miles, that's a lot of water. Now, I apologize for the quality of the map, but the map on the left shows in red, all the streams that are impaired by AMD. And you can see that covers a large portion of the state. Pennsylvania has over 250,000 acres of abandoned mine lands and accounts for over one third of all the AMLs in the country. So if we oversimplify it, there's basically two, st two styles of mining. Surface mining and deep mining. Deep mining is what most of us picture when you think of coal mining, men in long narrow tunnels chipping away at the coal seam. Surface mining 
The upper layer of strata is removed, exposing the coal seam. Strip mining was a popular method of surface mining in Pennsylvania. With stripping, they would remove the overburden or spoil pile. At, I'm sorry, or spoil and pile it beside the cut that they were mining. There's a lot of sulfide minerals like pyrite near the coal seams, and that's what frequently ended up on the top of the piles. So think about it. If you're digging a hole and putting what you take out of the hole right beside it, the last thing that you take out is what ends up on top of the pile. So those sulfide minerals, when exposed to air and water, form acid mine drainage. The abandoned mine, mine strips now often have sheer cliff faces or a high wall that poses a serious risk to human health. These strip pits are often flooded and can be drowning hazards. A lot of strip mines are located above deep mines and the water works its way down into the mine and continues to sour and add to the flow coming out of the deep mine. This is a picture of two spoil piles. On the right, you can see the stream is stained orange and that's from iron leaching out of the spoil piles. Deep mines fill with groundwater and becomes AMD, as your, your uh, abandoned mine drainage. Old air, air shafts pose entrapment hazards to humans. There are subsidence hazards in places where mine drainage occurred not all that deep. On the left, you can see my partner is measuring the volume of the mine drainage coming out of a deep mine. It's about 2,000 gallons a minute of nasty water coming out of that deep mine right there. On the right is a historical mine map showing room and pillar style mining, which was a popular technique in Pennsylvania. This is that same mind map zoomed out so you can see the whole mine. Just wanted to give you an idea of the size extent of these deep mines. Now, keep in mind, this is far from being one of the larger mines in the state. I just wanted to give you an idea of the scale. So there's your mine. And there's the ground above it. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see the size of the town. We'll go back. That mine is bigger than the town. And that was done by men on their hands and knees with picks. Very impressive. What you have is that whole area, all that water drains into the deep mine. And these that's why you have a lot of these discharges that will leach this nasty water all day, every day. This is the Auden Reed discharge, uh, drains a deep mine in the anthracite field. When you talk about a large, a large deep mine, this drains an area of 10,000 acres. The average flow coming out of this mine is over 10,000 gallons of gallons a minute of acidic water. That's just the average flow. Um, volumes can more than double after a rain event. Under average flows, in addition to the acidity, this discharge produces 600 pounds a day of aluminum and just completely devastates the entire upper, upper half of Catawissa Creek. All right, now that we have some background, let's take a look at what's happening in the mines and why it's so bad. There are many chemical reactions that take place in the formation of mine drainage, but this is the basic one. Excuse me. We can do a deep dive on chemistry in the future if the museum invites me back. Um, what this equation shows is that when pyrite is exposed to oxygen and water, the result is iron, sulfate, and a hydrogen ion. And that hydrogen ion is where the acidity comes from. This acidic water dissolves other metals in the mine, like iron and aluminum, and carries them in suspension. A lot of discharges in Pennsylvania have a pH of around three to four. Fish general, generally tolerate a pH between six and a half and eight. 
So even without the toxic metals, the acidity alone is enough to impact aquatic communities. Now you remember I said a lot of the discharges have a pH of between three and four. The thing to remember about the pH scale is that it's logarithmic. So neutral water has a pH of seven. And that means a, di a discharge with a pH of three is 10,000 times more acidic than neutral water. When mine drainage enters, enters the stream, it not only brings acidity, it carries solid and dissolved metals. One common metal found in the AMD is aluminum. Aluminum is dissolved from clay seams commonly found near coal. Suspended or dissolved aluminum is very toxic to fish and aquatic insects because it builds up on their gills and suffocates them. Aluminum falls out of suspension and becomes a solid when water reaches a pH in the range of five to eight and a half. And that's, that's what you're looking at in these pictures. That beautiful blue color is from precipitated toxic aluminum. Precipitated aluminum fills in the spaces in the rocky stream bottom. And these interstitial spaces are where aquatic insects live and where fish lay their eggs. So mine drainage continues to impact aquatic life even after the pH of the stream rises to an inhabitable levels. Iron is another metal commonly found in mine drainage. Iron's toxic to animals because it builds up in, in their organs. Uh, iron begins to precipitate at a pH of around 3.5. And that precipitated iron fills in the interstitial spaces and smothers aquatic vegetation. These two pictures of, of uh, these two pictures of, of the bottom of Moshannon Creek. You can see how the iron has encompassed or armored everything on the creek bed. The left picture, you can't even see the bottom at all. Uh, a lot of places in the upper, upper most Shannon, you can't even walk across because you get stuck in the iron that's been depositing there for hundreds of years. And you can see in the pictures, like there's nothing swimming there and there is nothing growing there. This is an interesting picture. This is uh, of sediment deposits in Catanning Run. You look at the top of the screen, you can see that it, the stream's almost entirely aluminum. And then right here, you have an iron discharge entering the creek. When that discharge enters the creek, that has a higher pH, causes the aluminum to fall out and precipitate that orange iron. On the right, where the water looks clean, this is actually a very acidic discharge entering the stream, has a pH in the twos, and that actually keeps the metals from suspend, or keeps the metals from precipitating. So this portion at the bottom right that looks clean actually has the nastiest water that you can see here. Uh, the effects of mine drainage aren't just limited to water quality and aquatic life. AMD discharges can create large dead zones. This is a relatively small one I was at last week along the Moshannon Creek. But then you have the Hughes, the Hughes borehole in Columbia, Cambria County, and that created a 15-acre dead zone. There's no plants. There's not much living there. So now you have a stream that doesn't have insects in it. There's no mayflies, no stoneflies flying around. There's large dead zones around it without trees. I haven't read a study on it, but it would reason to assume that you'll find suppressed bird and bat populations in areas like this. So how do we fix it? <clears throat> That's where my program comes in. It starts with investigation. 
might mean looking at old mine maps for likely discharge locations or walking an impaired stream and testing all the water that flows into it. Then samples are taken to quantify the volume of water and the loading levels that a discharge is producing. And then from that, a treatment plan, or excuse me, a treatment plan is devised. To oversimplify it, there's two types of treatment. There's active and passive. In passive treatment, AMD is generally treated without electrically or mechanically operated components or without chemical reagents. Active treatment of mine drainage uses chemicals round the clock to treat mine water directly. Passive systems are usually used to treat discharges with lower flows and low metal concentrations. They're usually comprised of a collection and conveyance system, multiple treatment cells, a flushing mechanism, and an area of gas exchange in a settling pond. And what's pictured here is the Fallbrook passive treatment system. The discharge is collected and gravity fed to the system. Mine water flows through three limestone beds. Those are on the right, they're the three gray rectangles. The limestone raises the pH and causes the metals to fall out. The water then flows into the the two blue settling ponds. You guys recognize that beautiful blue color again. The main metal uh, from this discharge is aluminum. Active treatment. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Here's uh, one of our recently constructed passive treatment systems. You can see it's basically just a limestone pit. And again, that raises the pH, and then your metals come out of suspension and get deposited into sediment ponds. Active treatment plants are able to treat higher flows and high concentrations of metals, and they, they do so with a relatively small footprint. The downside of chemical treatment is the cost. It's expensive to build. You have the annual cost of purchasing chemicals and you have to pay staff to operate it. That being said, there are many discharges in Pennsylvania that could never be treated passively. The concentrations of the metals are too high and the volumes of water coming out are, would just overwhelm a passive system. Um, there's newly introduced bill funding. So now some of the worst discharges in the state are able to be treated now that there's adequate funding. Uh, Susquehanna River Basin Commission received a bill grant to build an active treatment plant up in Tioga. The plant will collect five discharges and pump them to a centrally located plant for treatment. The plant will look like a wastewater treatment plant, but instead of treating the sewage, it's gonna treat the mine drainage. This is a dual train plant, so it's basically two plants in one. Um, this allows us to be able to treat more water or take one side offline during low flows for maintenance and repairs. Plant uh, is going to be able to treat up to 15 million gallons of water a day. The plant will return the treated water to two tributaries of the Tioga. We're storing over 22 miles of water. Because this is mine water, it's cold year round. So the Tioga will become a trout fishery. We're already trout in the headwaters above the AMD pollution. And once the plant's online, there will be trout in Blossburg. This really will be a des destination fishery and people will travel there to fish it and bring new money into the local economy. Homeowners will see a rise in property values when the river behind their house is no longer orange. The Hammond Reservoir holds an extra billion gallons of water to dilute the pollution in the Tioga. Once that plant's online, the, billions of, the billion gallons of water can be released during drought periods. 
If you'd like more information on the project, you can go to our website. There's a interactive story map that tells you all about it. Uh, in conclusion, you know, mind your Ranch has drastic and far reaching effects in the state of Pennsylvania. It's not just water quality and uh, it's, it's a challenge to remediate it, but it, it's one we're work, that we're working on. So we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Yep. Thank you so much. And I just want to say, if you want to come back and take a deep dive into chemistry, we'll be happy to have you back. So. Hey, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So let's get to some questions about the presentation. You mentioned bill funding for remediating mine drainage. Can you please explain what that is? Sure. Um, stands for the bipartisan infrastructure law. And this is the AML program. And <clears throat> what it did is it provided $3.7 billion over 15 years for cleaning up acid mine drainage and, and abandoned mine lands in the state of Pennsylvania. And that comes out to $245 million a year. And that money is going to go a long way to helping us clean all this mess up. So we have several questions about maps available to the public. Are there maps available that show the location of deep mining of, of coal deep mining locations? Um, how can you find out if your house was built near an abandoned mine? Mine, or are there um, maps detailed enough to show proximity to street addresses? Yeah, um, Penn State has a fantastic mine map uh, atlas. If you Google search Penn State Mind Map Atlas, um, you'll be able to zoom right into where your house is and you can see what happened underground there. And a couple of questions about the cleanup exactly. Um, is waste coal or comb considered part of the spoils or is it considered something different? <laughs> Sort of, sort of depends on who you talk to. Okay. Um, um, they can be considered two different things, but they have the same uh, mind drainage forming effect. And I guess maybe for the audience that does not know what waste coal is, what would that be uh, left over from? Often had low BTUs, so it wouldn't burn as, as hot. Um, sometimes it, it was mixed in with other rock. It's just not not worth uh, not worth the effort to take out for the dollar. Are there other dangers from abandoned mines? Are there explosions or other problems that might happen? Um, It, it it's slipping my mind right now, um, but there's a place in Pennsylvania where the it's just scorched earth because the coal mine caught on fire um, and has been burning for decades. Um, but as I said, you have a lot of human health hazards. Um, these sheer cliff faces and get trapped in a mine shaft. Uh, but not not so much explosions, no. And there are comments coming in. Centralia, I believe. There you go. Thank you very that. much. There you go. You've got lots of helpers today. So some more questions about the cleanup. So how will the substrate be cleaned up? How long does it take to clean the water? And then how do you monitor the water quality after? Sure. Um, the flushing of the substrate happens naturally. Uh, as you have storm events and high flows, that the rapid movement of the water scours the bottom surface and it, it'll flush it clean. And it, it happens quicker than most people would think. Um, really, it, it, in a matter of a couple months, you'll have a clean stream bottom. Um, 
fish are able to return almost in, instantaneously. Um, the slowest thing to happen is the recolonization of your aquatic insects as, as they move back in. And then the way we monitor it, we have, um, it's called a sonde. It measures multiple parameters like the pH, dissolved oxygen, turbidity and conductivity of the water. And they're submerged into the river. Um, we're gonna have three real-time stations up in the Tioga and in two of its tributaries to help uh, dial in the plant operation when it first starts. We've done electrofishing and uh, sampling of in-stream macroinvertebrates or water bugs um, to get a baseline of what's there now. And we had miles and miles and miles without a fish or a single bug, uh, almost all the way down to the Tioga Reservoir. So looking forward to quantifying the change that comes back after the plant comes online. Well, the question is, that's one of the questions. When will the Tioga treatment plant come online? We're currently at the 90% design phase. Um, Kleinfelder was the firm that we hired to design the plant. It is construction set to take place towards the end of next year and should be completed in 2007. Oh, I'm sorry. 2027. What happens to the aluminum once it's removed from the passive sediment ponds? Uh, a lot of times, so the aluminum, once it falls out, uh, it's inert. It's basically sediment. It's just no different than dirt. Um, but it, it gets dredged out of the passive system and hold away. Are there certain plants and vegetation that are good to raise the pH and help neutralize or take metals out of water? Um, the plants don't really raise the pH, but they will take, um, they'll help trap the, the sediment, um, the precipitated iron and aluminum. And uh, it actually helps take, uh, manganese out. Do treatment plants need to be in place forever? Or is it something that's temporary until the problem is remediated? No, they'll need to be there in perpetuity. Um, you have gradual improvement within the coal mines. You have what's called pyritic decay, where all that pyrite has already reacted with the air and the water. So you, you do have gradual improvement of the coal mines, but you know, you're talking hundreds of years until that, that mine heals itself. Um, so the plant will need to be there in perpetuity. And that may, you may have already answered this question, but it's, are there any areas that have adapted or adjusted to the acidity? Um, you have species of plants and animals that will tolerate more acidity than others, and those are sort of what moves into those places. Um, but with the mine drainage, you know, you just have a, a lot of these dead regions. Well, this leads to a, there have been several questions about um, what the general population, the average citizen can do um, to help clean up the water, to be part of this um, remediation. Are there any citizen science opportunities? What, what can the general public do to help? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, volunteer with the local watershed group. Um, they're always looking for a hand going out and sampling discharges. Um, it's a nice way to spend a day, take a walk in the woods and do some good.
And then a last question here about, um, are there maps also that show areas um, that have been, um, have been um, the most contaminated rivers or areas in Pennsylvania? Yeah, if you go to our website, there's a mine drainage portal um, and it has the location of a lot of the discharges and it shows in red all the streams that have uh, been declared impaired, excuse me, impaired by A and D. All right, I want to thank everyone for your questions. Andrew, what would you like the audience to remember from today's presentation? Um, you know, acid mine drainage and abandoned mine lands are a serious problem in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, as well as other agencies and groups, are working hard to fix the problem and protect one of our most valuable resources, and that's clean water. Andrew, thank you so much for presenting today about this important topic to Pennsylvania. Hey, thanks for having me. So I'm going to ask the audience to please join us again for more Learn at Lunchtime programs from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. You can. Um, visit the State Museum webpage at statemuseumpa.org for program information and to sign up.